Okay, here we are, chapter five. Plan is to um, hit the record button and the rates. Five, realism. One of the most common errors with regard to Indians has been the assumption that their thinking had certain premises common to modern man, that is, ideas of humanitarianism and of man or mankind as a unit. Indians had names usually for other tribes, but they called themselves the people. Many groups had only a minimal regard even for the tribe. They wandered as small bands gathering food, moving from place to place in search of edible items, and numbered sometimes 15 or 20 people. For an entire tribe of a few hundred or more, for an entire tribe of a few hundred or more to move as a unit would have exhausted the hunting, fishing, the food gathering and f For an entire tribe of a few hundred or more to move as a unit would have exhausted the hunting, fishing and food gathering possibilities in any area. The older Indians I knew, Paiutes and Shoshone, had neither interest in nor love of man in general. Survival was basic and the need to endure harsh circumstances made men under unsentimental. and the need to harsh circumstances made men unsentimental and non-idealistic. The modern perspective warps judgments. Men will speak of their concern for and love of mankind, but despise their neighbour, their employer, their employee, or sometimes their husband or their wife. Their professed love of mankind is a humanistic religious faith, their day-by-day -day living makes it obvious that they dislike or even hate many people. It is easier to love mankind in general than to love a person who causes us serious problems. I once encountered a churchwoman who said that the she... I once encountered a churchwoman who said that she immediately distrusted any new pastor who spoke about his love for the flock. She knew how many hypocrites and sinners there are in any congregation, and she thought anyone who spoke of loving the flock instead of loving the Lord is either a hypocrite or a fool. While younger Indians, and especially Indian rabble-rousers who knew how to appeal to sentimental whites, might talk about mankind... Such thinking was alien to the elderly Indians. This non-sentimental and localised vision often gave a hard and healthy edge to their thinking. The three elders of the Western Shoshone Mission were Guy Manning, Shoshone, Tom Premo, Shoshone, and Louis Dave, Paiute, men of superior intelligence. Guy Manning remains in my memory as one of the finest men I have known, one man, a Presbyterian missions officer who met with our session, told me a few years later that ours was the finest church session he had ever met with, and virtually all his association had been with white urban churches. It was the Indians' hard realism, linked to a strong Christian faith which had impressed them, which it was the... hard realism linked to a strong Christian faith which had impressed him. I can best illustrate this by citing one of my very first meetings with them. I asked about the religious character of the Indians on the reservation, about 900 people. A few, they said, adhere to the old belief in the wolf spirit and most have some of the old super superstition. And most have 
some of the old superstitions and practices, but the essential faith of all, save themselves and the other Christians, was in the whiskey religion. I laughed when they said that. They laughed too, but then they told me the... And they... Then they told me earnestly that it was also very true and why it was true. A man's religion is what he relies on in trouble and also in a time of happiness for healing and relief. Religion is what a man cannot live without. That is what whiskey is to most Indians and they added to some white men also. Paul Tillich very aptly described religion as ultimate concern. In a variation of this idea, these elders defined religion as ultimate need, as what a man in a crisis... As what a man in the crises, as well as in the joys of life, must have to live. I learned that the term whiskey religion was common among many of the older men, including the alcoholics. It was a powerful recognition of the importance of liquor and illustrative of their realism. Such clarity of thought was lacking among the younger generation whose minds had been blurred by statist education. I was greatly impressed by the thinking behind the term whiskey religion. On a few occasions I have used the term with various audiences, but the level of comprehension has not been high. Apart from being a clever expression, its implications don't usually, don't easily. A, being a clever expression, its implications don't easily register. Most people and many churches have their counterpart to whiskey religion, something that, whatever their formal professions of faith, whether humanism or Christianity, represents that thing without which they cannot live. Much could be said about the Indians that would show them in a bad light, yet only... Much could be said about the Indians that would show them in a bad light, yet only be somewhat accurate. Alcoholism has been prevalent, adultery commonplace, and so on. The various Indian tribes represent broken cultures. The hold their old culture has is real, but its vitality is gone. More than any tribal heritage, whiskey religion commands them. The hard realism of the phrase whiskey religion is very important to me. The older Indians have been romanticised but they were not a romantic people. Louis Dave, for example, classically Indian in appearance, could describe the old life vividly from personal experience. As a boy, he had been a member of one of the still independent Paiute bands. He could tell me of a... He could tell me... He could tell me of his use of a bow and arrow, where he had camped and hunted and so on. Shortly after World War II, uh, shortly after World War II, I believe it was. Shortly after World War II, I believe it was, he became a commissioner of L. Shortly after World War II, I believe it was, he became a commissioner or elder delegate to the Presbyterian General Assembly in the East. He chose to fly there rather than to take a train, and his ascent above the clouds was a very great delight to him. Other older Indians, Christian and non-Christian, listened to his accounts of the journey with equal delight. Flying was one of the triumphs of the white man. A few Indians had been on flight crews in World War II and done well. Without ceasing to be Indians, they had become part of the wider world. There was one of the old Paiutes whose late father, Chief Padikap, 
at lead pipe resistance in southwestern Oregon. The spuns, the spuns so mlemeko. The sun spoke no English. Young Indian rights advocates, of whom there were very few at Aohi, and others called this old man Chief Padicap, which other old Paiute men resented. Padicap had gone to Washington, D.C. to testify before a congressional panel through a translator clothed in plain Indian garb. As such, he was a very dramatic figure with his intense eyes and passionate Paiute oratory. Padigap's senior contemporaries regarded him as a pathetic tool and a man not altogether in his right mind. Padigap talked to me as a potential ally because of my dark hair, eyes and complexion, and my foreignness. The other old Indians often concluded their slurs about Padigap's mentality with this statement. The other old Indians often concluded their slurs about Padicap's mentality with the statement, He doesn't understand much English. I thought at first this was a case of stating the obvious until he was explained to me. What am I talking about? I thought at first this was a case of stating the obvious until it was explained to me. Entrance into the real world of the 20th century required knowing English. Otherwise, intellectually, a man was still going around shivering in moccasins and a loincloth. This was for them a common image for stupidity in an Indian of this day. They felt a kindly pity for the old paddy cap. None of these men was other than content with being an Indian, but they disliked the idea of being an Indian meant being a fool. That, I'm missing about that. Oh. One second. But they disliked the idea that being an Indian meant being a fool. The men whom they ridiculed as foolish were the younger men who were using paddy cap. After all, They spoke English, so what was their excuse for being fools? The realism of the the older Indians. The realism of the older Indians was a notable quality. Both whites and Indians need it today. All right. Happy days, people. Hello, this is Nathan. Thanks for joining me in the booth. I really hope you're enjoying the live streams and videos. To find out more about this narration project, or to make a donation, go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks. Chapter 6. What do you know? All right, hit the record, let's go. 6. Work. In Christianized cultures, a man's calling is to work and to provide for his family. According to Francis X. Murphy, the earliest Christian documents stress, quote, the sacredness of work over the evil of idleness, end quote. In Ephesians 4.28, Paul declares, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth, end quote. James Moffat rendered it thus, Let the thief steal no more, rather let him work and put his hands to an honest task, so as to have something to contribute to the needy. End quote. 
Paul tells us, first, ungodly work usually has ungodly motives. It is governed by the spirit of theft by both employer and worker. It is often ruled by a desire to avoid work. The antithesis is between work and theft. Normally, gain is possible only by one or the other. Gain by gifts or by inheritance or like means is not commonplace. Men must look to work unless they choose theft for their sustenance. Second, Paul stresses the religious requirements of honest work. Slovenly and lazy work are forms of theft. Third, Paul requires that work be governed by more than a desire for self-support or family support, commendable as these are. There is also an obligation in Christ to give to the needy. It is important to stress this text because on the mission field among backward peoples, the work ethic is lacking, whether among the Indian tribes or the Americas or the... whether among the Indian tribes or the Americas or the Papuans. In some cultures, work is the duty of women and slaves. This does not mean that Indian men were parasites living off their women. In earlier days, the men had their responsibilities. They were warriors, hunters and fishermen. Among some tribes, war was uncommon. None had much to steal and their meagre life did not invite attack. The arrival of horses with the Spanish made fighting easier. Among Western tribes, those connected with buffalo hunting were the more warlike. Most Western tribes did no farming. In virtually all tribes, men despised manual labour. The horse was an important part of knightly pride and power in feudal Europe. Among American Indians, it served the same purpose. It was common in my day for an Indian to have 40 to 50 horses. Very few of these were broken to harness or saddle, but they were important as a form of wealth and a source of pride. Late one night, while I was talking... Late one night, while I was taking some young Indians home from a church meeting... A number of horses bolted across the road. Before I could stop, I ran into a young stallion and broke its leg. The Indian owner wanted no compensation. It was not a horse he had trained for use. He did not know how many more he had. Had I been a stranger, he might have accepted a few dollars. Knowing me, he did not. He was rich in horses and would not miss this one. Poor old broken leg horse, eh? He was rich in horses and would not miss the one he had to kill because of its broken leg. It was a beautiful sight to see Indian boys of five or six ride as though they were a part of the horse. While a few Indians became reasonably good in rodeos and the annual Indian rodeo at Aoi was very much relished, the Indian riders were different. Normally in a rodeo, the white American rider is successful because mastery over the horse is important to him. The Indian may be at times as hard on a young horse as any white American or harder, but his attitude towards his horse is different or was in those days. The young Indian would usually be very young, but breaking a horse to saddle was like entrance to manhood, and his horse, gentle by his training, was a source of pride and status. Indians made good cowboys, but in most tribes poured poured chipperter. Poor shepherders, poor sheep herders. Poor sheep herders. A cowboy feels lordly and looks down at the cattle. A sheep herder lives with the sheep, bottle feeds orphaned lambs and doctors ailing or hurt sheep. Few cowhands prosper and become ranchers themselves. Sheep herders usually save their money and buy their own ranches. The Indians I knew were aware of the fact that the Navajo are sheepmen, and this amazed them. 
One elderly man once said to me of the Navajo, They must be some other kind of people. The Indians, if not spoiled by alcoholism, were good cattlemen. They were very poor farmers. Farming seemed to them to be women's work. In my day, the only Indians who had family gardens or a family orchard were Christians. And, and, gotta get it right. In my day, the only Indians who had family gardens and a family orchard were Christians. Eh, shabalaba ding dong. In my day, the only Indians who had family gardens and a family orchard were Christians. Guy Manning kept bees which amazed other Indians. Cattle work had a natural appeal to the Indians. In the old days, the Paiutes and the Shoshones travelled widely, hunting and fishing in small family bands. The bands would come together only occasionally. The spring branding roundup brought them all together out of the hills and was thus a time of great celebration as well as work. To a lesser degree, the fall seal time cattle roundup was also a tribal occasion. Every 4th of July, there was a tribal encampment of the non-Christians lasting from a week to two weeks. The families came together in a great circle of tents for dancing, gambling, drinking, and not a few less reputable activities. Some families were usually unwilling to decamp, and the tribal councils sometimes had to send the Indian police a fair... And the tribal council sometimes had to send the Indian police officer to order them to do so. Indian girls and women were usually very good workers. A woman's life schooled her for working. Men, however, could be good workers where they were under authority, but on their own were less successful unless Christian. But the men did respect work. The Indians of my day were, in a few instances, trained at Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which was founded in 1879, just two years after the reservation was cleared. Cleared. Just two years after the reservation was created. The institution, of which baseball great Jim Thorpe was an alumnus, was one of the boarding schools to which Indian boys were forcibly sent. If a father hid his boy to avoid losing him to the school, he was publicly chained in irons near the agency office until the boy was surrendered. Older Indians showed me the place where their fathers had been chained. The church elder, Thomas Premo, was a Carlisle man. In time, to be a Carlisle student began to have a little distinction. In time also, although the older Indians never forgot the harshness of chains, they also began to respect what the boys learned at Carlisle. Thanks to their pragmatism, the Indians, especially the Shoshones, were quick to pick up the white man's standards. The white man for them meant a world of victory, high skills and tools. For the same reason, they despised the black man as a loser. Very quickly, practices which the white man would view unfavourably were either discarded or suppressed from public attention. I learnt, I learnt once to once. I learned once of an instance of sexual practice not mentioned in anthropo- anthropological. I learned once. I learned once of an instance of sexual practice not mentioned in anthropological reports. In earlier days, it existed sometimes neither approved nor disapproved. Suppressing any reference to it and making no mention of the single case that I knew of, except among the Christian men, did not mean any fear of criticism by whites. Neither did it mean any emulation of the white man. Rather, it was the association of certain standards with a certain level of civilization. Q. 
Curiously, in those days, the older Indians assumed that all white men were Christians, even though almost none of the whites they knew attended church. It was assumed that being a white American meant being a Christian, and it was difficult to shake that belief. On the other hand, they recognised the differences among white Americans in many spheres. I was routinely told, sometimes with crude humour, that Indian agency whites were the white men of lower intelligence and less inclined to work. Why, then, did Indians fail to understand that being a white man did not make a man a Christian? The reason for this inability to separate the two was that the older generation saw faith and culture as inseparable. They well knew how many of them had white blood, in some cases because of illegitimate children born to Indian girls, but also because some white men joined the Indian tribes and married one or more Indian girls. They then became Indian as far as the tribe was concerned. Such men took part readily in all Indian practices. They were now Indians. Christians among Indians were still regarded, in my day, as having abandoned Indianhood. That they looked like Indians and spoke Paiute or Shoshone did not alter the fact of separation. I was reminded of the fact that, in the early church, Christians were called by their enemies, quote, the Christian race, end quote, and Christians spoke of... And Christians spoke so of themselves. Our present perspective is radical. A man is a Caucasian. Is racial. Our present perspective is racial. A man is Caucasian, Negroid or Amerind, regardless of the faith he professes, and we have as our fundamental criterion his colour. This has not always been so. A man's faith has at times determined his race, Christian, Indian or whatever else. On the reservation I once heard said of a busy Indian who was future-oriented, He works like a white man. I believe these older Indians were right in seeing religion and culture as closely related. Our failure now to make the connection is leading to disaster. All right. That was that chapter. It's so last chapter. Out of fashion, it's outmoded. Out with the old, in with the new. Okay, hope to see you in chapter seven. Chalabala. Okay, folks, here we are. We are in chapter seven. We're going to hit the record button. Unprecedented, unprecedented, I know. Let's go. Seven. The Renegade. Two days ago, in a Modesta, California bookstore, I saw a paperback edition of a novel entitled Shoshone Mike. Earlier in the 1980s, I saw a quote-unquote biography of Shoshone Mike and, over the years, several magazine articles or references to him. It was during World War II that I first read about Shoshone Mike. His death in 1911, together with a small band of followers, was described in articles and books as the last battle in the Indian Wars. Shoshone Mike was depicted as an Indian freedom fighter battling for the old Indian way of life. Yeah. Shoshone Mike was depicted as an Indian freedom fighter battling for the old Indian way of life. Since Shoshone Mike was from Oihi, I was immediately interested in him. I asked some of the elderly Shoshone Indians about him. Their reactions were amusement, disgust and anger. They resented that he was called a Shoshone, for he was a renegade. Life for the Indians was not categorised by the same terms that mark white American life and Indian life nowadays. For instance, when the Shoshones required unanimity from all men before going to war, 
or to allow the Idaho Power Company to bring electricity to the reservation, the reason externally seemed like extreme democracy. But it was rather a belief in tribal solidarity. One old Shoshone Lindian, Lindian? <clears throat> One old Shoshone Indian, not a Christian, had a great difficulty understanding white, Taibo culture. For him, solidarity created the expectation that all white men should be Christian. Indians who converted to Christianity were non-Indians who continued to live among Indians. The perspective was not racial, but tribal. People from other tribes in the past had been adopted, as had whites, and simply became members of the tribe. The idea of diversity within a nation was alien to the old Indian. Typical of American Indians, the Shoshone had no name for themselves. They were the people. If you broke with them, you ceased to be one of the people. For this old Shoshone, as for others, the name Shoshone Mike was highly objectionable. He was a renegade and therefore not a Shoshone. The old man also expressed contempt for the idea that Mike was a freedom fighter. Freedom, he said, is a Taibo idea. For an Indian, the choice was life in the tribe or life elsewhere. The kindest term I heard for Shoshone Mike came from a Christian Shoshone. The man, he said, was a real coyote. Others described him as a thief, a liar, a man who wanted to live off others, a horse thief, a cattle thief. He was completely untrustworthy. If he told you the sun was shining, you looked up to make sure he wasn't lying. The only reason no Indian killed him was fear of punishment for murder. In those days, death at the hands of a Taibo court. Shoshone Mike and his small group, about 15 men, women and children, left the reservation to rustle cattle and steal from white ranchers. They apparently killed people in the process and were finally all killed by an angry posse. It was not a late battle in the Indian Wars. It was simply a case of an outlaw being killed. But Shoshone Mike gets a hero's treatment from white, white writers. It was simply a case of an outlaw being killed. But Shoshone Mike gets a hero's treatment from white writers. Why? A few of the Indians raised annoyed and insistent questions. Why do the white men make heroes out of the bad Indians? Why do they like only the Indians who fought against them? What about us Shoshones who were mostly peaceful? The old Shoshones were proud of their record as a peaceful tribe where the white man was concerned. Conflicts were few. Their reason for compliance was simple, common sense. They were as capable of fighting as any other tribe. In fact, one southern Shoshone group, the Comanche, proved themselves to be very successful warriors. One very old Shoshone smiled as he explained why his tribe was peaceable. We saw that the white man had guns and wheels, he said, and we didn't. We knew that he had too great an edge over us. This was another reason why they detested Shoshone Mike. He had no common sense. Stealing Indians' cows was one thing. When that became difficult, he turned to stealing from the white ranchers. He seemed to believe that he could escape the consequences of his acts. During the 1960s, the young men and women who joined the hippie world were called dropouts. This is an excellent term, and it well described what they were people who had abandoned the prevailing culture and society, they were renegades. Similarly, Shoshone Mike and his band were dropouts from Shoshone life. Another word appalled. Another word applied to him. Another word applied to him. Another word applied to him. Outlaw. 
It is hard for us to appreciate the meaning of the term renegade, one who leaves a faith and culture, an apostate, an outlaw, one who is outside the law. Criminal quote-unquote rights have now placed the American criminal more firmly within the protection of the law than his victims, so that the word outlaw has an ancient and fictional So that the word outlaw has an ancient and fictional meaning for many. Let us return to the question, why do the white men make heroes out of bad Indians? Why do they like only the Indians who fought against them? Otto Scott observed that, as long as the Indian was a threat to white Americans, the white man was ready to report on every Indian misdeed. But when the Indian was no longer a menace, he became the object of sentimentality. This glamorization suggests some very grim problems in white American culture. If the white American does not know the truth about himself, he will not know it about others. If he believes in the natural goodness of all men after Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he will sentimentalize all his relationships. It is easy to project evil onto his ancestors or to some other group today and to see himself as the good man because his ideas are informed by liberal myths. He calls Shoshone Mike a freedom fighter because he sees himself in the forefront of the battle for freedom. He cannot understand Indian culture because he is ignorant of his own. The old Shoshones mildly rebukes the... The old Shoshones mildly rebuked me for believing what I read about Shoshone Mike. They were right. Hello, you fool. Oh, well, that was chapter seven. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope to see you in chapter eight. Well done for listening right to the end. If you would like to know more about this important Christian audiobook project, please go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks.